Well, how about that? Pretty interesting, huh? They have quite a few paintings there that I showed you from a Catholic website. I mean, I, I talked about that thing years ago, and I remember some Catholics got upset, and they said, I never heard of a blonde-haired Mary. That's ridiculous. I never heard of that. That's crazy. Oh, well, your own artists have been painting it that way for centuries, many centuries. So, sorry, but that's the way it is. But let me show you here. Here we have The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. And again, Catholics try to deny this book. They say, that's been debunked. It has not been debunked. That is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, be open-minded, read the book, and then compare it to what Catholicism is actually doing and teaching. And you'll see that it lines up perfectly. But let's look here at uh, page 85. And this is going to be very important to understand this. It says here, in a land of dark-eyed beauties with raven locks, in other words, raven like a the raven bird, black, in other words, with raven locks, the Madonna was always represented with blue eyes and golden hair, a complexion entirely different from the Jewish complexion, which naturally would have been supposed to belong to the mother of our Lord, but which precisely agrees with that which all antiquity attributes to the goddess queen of Babylon, Semiramis. In almost all lands, the great goddess has been described with golden or yellow hair, showing that there must have been one grand prototype to which they were all made to correspond. I'm going to show you why that's so significant. I mean, the fact is, you know, in, in terms of modern literature, I'm going to, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but the fact is, you saw the paintings where Mary sometimes is depicted as having dark hair, sometimes it's blonde hair. Very, very bright blonde hair sometimes. Hmm. Why? Let me show you this. Over here we have page 97, Christmas and Lady Day. Now remember what I said earlier on about in Islam, in the Quran, it teaches that Mary gave birth to Jesus under a palm tree. And what's the time that you celebrate the supposed birth of Jesus? Christmas. Christmas. Down here it says, The Christmas tree, now so common among us, was equally common in pagan Rome and pagan Egypt. In Egypt, that tree was the palm tree. In Rome, it was the fir, the palm tree denoting the pagan Messiah as Baal Tamar, the fir referring to him as Baal Bereth. The mother of Adonis, the sun god and great mediatorial divinity, was mystically said to have been changed into a tree and went in that state to have brought forth her divine son. If the mother was a tree, the son must have been recognized as the man of the branch. And it goes into the rest there. I'm not going to read all that. You can read that. Pause it if you want. Read it. But isn't that interesting? That the original Christmas tree was a palm tree. Hmm. Interesting. You say, why is that interesting? Well, because as I was doing some research online, um, there was actually an ancient Persian depiction of Mary giving birth to Jesus, according to the Quran, under the palm tree. And this ancient Persian depiction here, I'm going to show it. I have it printed out here. Here's your palm tree. There's Jesus on fire or something, I guess. I don't know. But uh, notice that uh, Mary, surprise, surprise, does not have black hair. She has what looks to be blonde hair. Her hair is not black. But yet it was made by Persians. Wouldn't the Persians, being Shemitic type of people themselves, wouldn't they have uh, made Mary with black hair? Why show a palm tree, number one, number two, you know, because it's according to the Quran, I realize, but number two, why show Mary with blonde hair? Interesting. Very, very interesting. Now let me show you some modern day literature. Here we have the satanic series of books written by a devout Catholic. You have the Lord of the Rings series right here. Okay, it starts out there with The Hobbit, then it goes to the Fellowship of the Ring, then the Two Towers, then 
Return of the King. And I'm going to show you here the significance of this thing in the Fellowship of the Ring. And I, I really want to bring out a study on this whole thing sometime because I have done uh, extensive research into Tolkien and his whole system. Um, back in the 20th century, the early 1900s, there were um, there was a Council of Witches. Uh, it's written about in Doreen Irvine's book. Um, it's here behind me somewhere. I have it. Uh, well, it's there. I'll show it in another study. Uh, oh, right here. I was trying to find it. The Navit is part of my thing here, but Freed from Witch Witchcraft by Doreen Irvine. And in this book, she talked about she was a high, very high level witch and she met this World Council of Witches, and they said, we need to find a way to make witchcraft more palatable to the masses. And there were many ways that that was going to happen, but mostly through media. And the witchcraft language, the runic language, was kept secret up until that time. And the very first one to bring it out into popular media was that man right there, John Ronald Rule Tolkien. J.R.R. Tolkien was a professor, I think it was either Cambridge or Oxford, I forget which of the two, where he was a professor at, but the point is, this man was a devout Roman Catholic, and he was a real Roman Catholic. In other words, he understood what Catholicism was. He understood that it was the ancient mystery pagan Babylonian system, and his great desire, his, his whole purpose in life was to reintroduce paganism as Christianity, and to sanctify paganism and he that's what he wanted more than anything else to bring witchcraft into the mainstream and guess what through him and c.s lewis which i'm going to be talking about here in, in a minute through the two of them they popularized the idea of witchcraft that's what their books are all about it's witchcraft and those two men brought witchcraft and the occult out of the closet and into the open with their whole system, okay? But let me show you some interesting quotes here in the Fellowship of the Ring, back here, page 422. Here you have there in this forest area there, and they're talking to this witch queen, the Lady Galadriel. Here she says, there's nothing, well, first of all, she's asking what these different people uh, want, and there's a dwarf named Gimli. And she asks him, what do you want? And he says, there's nothing, Lady Galadriel, said Gimli, bowing low and stammering, nothing unless it might be, unless it is permitted to say, or to ask Nay to name a single strand of your hair, which surpasses the gold of the earth, as the stars surpass the gems of the mine. I do not ask for such a gift, but you commanded me to name my desire." The elves stirred and murmured with astonishment, and Celebron gazed at the dwarf in wonder, but the lady smiled. It is said that the skill of the dwarves is in, your, in, in their hands rather than in their tongues, she said, yet that is not true of Gimli, for none have ever made to me a request so bold and yet so courteous, and how shall I refuse since I commanded him to speak? But tell me, what would you do with such a gift? Treasure it, lady, he answered, in memory of your words to me at our first meeting, and if ever... I return to the smithies of my home. It shall be set in imperishable crystal to be an heirloom of my house and a pledge of goodwill between the mountain and the woods uh, until the end of days. <clears throat> then the lady uh, unbraided one of her long tresses and cut off three golden hairs and laid them in Gimli's hands. Okay? And it goes on to read a bunch of other ridiculous, stupid nonsense. You say, what's the point? Well, there you see this elf witch this lady Galadriel and she cuts off three of her hairs because they are gold and the dwarves in his stories are admirers of gold and precious stones and things like that. Keep that in mind. Next we're going to go to the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. Okay, Edited by Humphrey Carpenter. These are the ones that uh, he was writing back and forth with people. Let's look at a couple of these quotes in here. I'm going to show you the philosophy of this man, this Tolkien. 
Out of the darkness of my life, so much frustrated, I put before you the one great thing to love on earth, the blessed sacrament. Not Jesus Christ, not the King James Bible, the blessed sacrament. This pagan, cannibalistic ritual where you claim to be eating God, the flesh and the blood of God. That's the one thing that you can love on the earth. It says here, There you will find romance, glory, honor, fidelity, and the true way of all your loves upon earth, and more than that, death by the divine paradox, that which ends life and demands the surrender of all, and yet, by the taste or foretaste of which alone can what you seek in your earthly relationships, love, faithfulness, joy, be maintained, or take on the complexion of reality of eternal endurance, which every man's heart desires. In other words, he's saying that you can get saved and have eternal life through eating the stupid cookie and drinking the wine. Satanic heresy, of course. But now look at this. Over here on page 76. On Thursday, I gave two lectures and had some troublesome business in town and was too tired to attend the Lewis Seance. Clive Staples Lewis, uh, C.S. Lewis, also known as, um, and his brother were members of the Inklings, the secret society, so to speak, a little club, little writer's guild that Tolkien was also a member of. And there's also uh, Johnny Todd, which was, you know, he was born into the Illuminati, and he said that uh, C.S. Lewis, as well as Tolkien, and this little group there, they were members of the Golden Dawn, the Order of the Golden Dawn, very high-level Satanism. And, but... Very interesting there that uh, this great hero, Christian hero of the faith, C.S. Lewis, would have a seance, calling up dead spirits. Uh, well, not really too shocking, actually, if you know about a lot of these guys over there in the UK, because you had Fenton John Anthony Hort and Brooke Foss Westcott, who were also part of the Ghostly Guild and some of these other things that were before Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, and they were also conjuring up dead spirits. The men who came out with the revised version, the reintroduced the corrupted Alexandrian text, which brought out the revised version, the American Standard Version, and then all the other new versions up through the 20th century and into the 21st century. So you see, it, all this stuff ties together. When you start to research this stuff, a lot of this, a lot of the things about the Bible-believing movement are going to seem very confusing at first. You're going to be like, I don't really understand all this stuff. But you know, as you go through it and you really study you'll see how everything ties together. It all ties right together. And this movement of contacting dead spirits and, and occultism and all this other stuff and Christianizing it, it was going on with Westcott and Hort, and it was going on with Tolkien and Lewis. They just carried on the work that their satanic forefathers you know, had started. Here you have um, page 96 of this book. Um, nobody is a greater... Uh, CSL, you know, Clive Staples, Lewis there, reactions were odd. Nothing is a greater tribute to red propaganda than the fact that he who knows that knows they are in all other subjects, liars and traducers, believes all that is said against Franco, you know, the, the Italian dictator there in um, Italy, you know, during World War II. You had Hitler, um, not Italy, I'm sorry, Spain, Spain. Um, Hitler in Germany, Mussolini in Italy, Franco in Spain. Um, but anyways, getting back to it, it says, Nothing that is said for him. Even Churchill's open speech in Parliament left him unshaken. But hatred of our church, Roman Catholicism, is after all the really, real only final foundation of the C of E, so deep laid that it remains even when all the superstructure seems removed. CSL, for instance, reveres the Blessed Sacrament and admires nuns. Yet if a Lutheran is put in jail, he is up in arms. But if Catholic priests are slaughtered, he disbelieves it and I dare say really thinks they asked for it. But R.C. shook him up a bit. Shook him a bit. Okay? Another member of the ghostly, or the um, inklings there. Uh, so you see that thing again there. But he reveres the Blessed Sacrament and admires nuns. And he had a friend that was a nun, too, by the way. Interesting. Okay, but now remember, what did we just read here in the Fellowship of the Ring? We read that this Lady Galadriel 
had blonde hair, pure gold hair. And so beautiful was it that actually this dwarf that lusted after gold asked her for a strand of her hair, and she gave him three. Okay? Lady Galadriel, a witch queen, the queen of witchcraft, you know, in the Lord of the Rings series, she's an elf witch. She's a sorceress, it talks about, you know, and this woman has gold hair. Keep that in mind. To Robert Murray, S.J. Whenever you see an S.J., that means Society of Jesus. This man is a Jesuit. Father Robert Murray, grandson of Sir James Murray, the founder of the Oxford English Dictionary and a close friend of the Tolkien family, had read part of the Lord of the Rings in galley proofs and typescript and had, at Tolkien's instigation, sent comments and criticism. He wrote that the book left him with a strong sense of a positive compatibility compatibility with the order of grace and compared the image of Galadriel to that of the Virgin Mary. A Jesuit would read the Lord of the Rings and he would read it and he'd say, you're comparing uh, Galadriel, that's the Virgin Mary, isn't it? And Tolkien goes on to say yes. Huh? Could it be that the Jesuits understand who the Mary of Catholicism really is? Oh, yeah. And we're going to see that a little bit later. Down here it says, the Lord of the Rings, the same page here, just going down here. He writes back to him. He says, the Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. Unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. Hmm. For the religious element is absorbed into the story and the symbolism. Should chiefly be grateful for having been brought up since I was eight in a faith that has nourished me and taught me all the little that I know. So, anyhow, it goes on to talk about things there and whatever else. But the fact of the matter is, he admits that, yeah, it is a Catholic work. Hmm. I'm going to show you a couple other interesting quotes here. He says uh, here, The other power then took over, the writer of the story, by which I do not mean myself. That one ever-present person who is never absent and never named. Hmm. So Tolkien is saying that uh, there's somebody else that's actually writing The Lord of the Rings? Another uh, power? The one who is uh, ever-present but never named? Page 288. Or more important, I am a Christian which can be deduced from my stories and in fact a Roman Catholic. The latter fact perhaps cannot be deduced, though one critic by letter asserted that the invocations of Elbereth and the character of Galadriel, as directly described or through the words of Gimli and Sam, were clearly related to Catholic devotion to Mary. Another saw in Waybred, Lembus, Viaticum, and the reference to its feeding of the will, and being more potent when fasting, a deriv derivation from the Eucharist. So, the Lord of the Rings series, this whole ridiculous series of books here, this whole thing here, it's Catholic propaganda that brings witchcraft into the limelight. Interesting. Look at reverse, or, uh, page 289. He says here, I am not a model of scholarship, but in the matter of the third age, I regard myself as a recorder only. Now, in the occult world, this is known as automatic writing, okay, where you have a devil spirit come into you, and that spirit takes over, and you basically are just a recorder. The thing just kind of does all the work, and you just let the thing be in control of your body. That also happens in rock and roll music. You'll see a lot of quotes from rock and roll musicians where they're saying, when I get up on stage, it's like I'm a third party to the whole thing. I just kind of, something comes in and takes over. Yeah, it's called devil spirits. That's who wrote the Lord of the Rings. 
the Lord of the Rings series, and I'm going to be burning this thing eventually here. I'm going to be doing some more work with this, and then these things are getting burned because I don't want them in my house. But the Lord of the Rings series is actually written by devils. To give you the Greek word, demons. You say, this is the most ridiculous, most absurd thing I've ever heard. The Lord of the Rings was written by a demon. Oh, for crying out loud. You are just off the deep end. You crazy, lunatic, Protestant, Bible-believing, Bible-thumper, um, all the other titles I get called. Well, uh, how about if I could show you a quote where Tolkien himself admits it? Page 401, The Life and Letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. From a letter to Christopher Tolkien, 31st of July, 1969. I have at last managed to release the demon of invention. He admits it in his own words. Right there in the book. What are you going to do with that? You say, well, I don't That's ridiculous. That's absurd. I, that's stupid. Boy, that sure is dumb. He admits it. And of course, you know, I know somebody's going to, some little smarty pants is going to come out and they're going to say, well, you see in the ancient Greek philosophers, they consider demons to be a mark of genius and they're, they're demi-gods and stuff like this and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, because they were possessed with devils and trying to say that that made them intelligent. That's what's going on there. But how about this thing of Mary being the queen of heaven? Let's look up in the Bible about this thing. Does the Bible mention the queen of heaven? Yeah, actually it does. But not in a uh, positive context. Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah 7 verse 17 through 20. It says here, Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle, kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man, and upon beast, and upon the trees of the field, and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn, and shall not be quenched. Hmm. Cakes to the queen of heaven, and drink offerings. Almost like the uh, blessed sacrament. Oh yeah. And if you study it, that's exactly what's going on here. Making these little round wafers, and having drink offerings. It's not communion. That's why the little wafer there is a round disc. It is a meant to symbolize the sun god. Like I said in my video about the uh, 13 reasons why every Christian must reject the mass, they take that little sun disc, that round sun disc, and they elevate it. Just like the sun coming up in the morning. It's Baal. It's a phallic ceremony. And again, I described it in the other one. You know, you can watch that. But now let's look at Jeremiah 44. We're going to see this thing again about this um, queen of heaven. And here, notice, very interesting, in the other passage there in Jeremiah chapter 7, you had them making cakes and drink offerings. Look what they do here. Jeremiah 44, starting at verse 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, in Pathros answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. Just like a lot of you Catholics are doing right now. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care about proof. I don't care about truth. I am not going to hearken to you. Why? I'll show you why. Verse 17. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, and our princes in the cities of Judah, and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals, and were well, and saw no evil. It's like a lot of Catholics. I've been a Catholic all my life. My mother was a Catholic. My father was a Catholic. My grandparents were Catholics on both sides of the family. My great-grandparents going back, back, back. 
and we've always done well. We've always prospered. And notice now a new thing entered in here. They're burning incense also to the Queen of Heaven. Do they burn incense? Do, do Catholics burn incense to Mary? Oh, yeah. You see them swinging the little incense thing back and forth, and then they burn candles and stuff to her and all this other stuff. Yeah. It's just ancient pagan Babylonian witchcraft is what modern Catholicism is. But uh, it says here in verse 18, But since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to, to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, and to the men, and to the women, and to all the people which had given him that answer, saying, The incense that ye burn in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings, and your princes, and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them, and came it not into his mind? See that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which he have comp committed. Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day. Because ye have burned incense and because ye have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his law, nor in his statutes, nor in his testimonies. Therefore this evil is happened unto you as at this day. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the people and to all the women, Hear the word of the Lord, all Judah, that are in the land of Egypt. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hand, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Therefore hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah and in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God liveth. Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. Yet a small number that are escaped this uh, that escape the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah, and all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know whose words shall stand, mine or theirs. And see, that's really the whole issue here. If what I'm saying is just ridiculous nonsense, then Catholicism will just go on and continue and be this wonderful thing and be greatly blessed by the Lord. If what I'm saying is right, though, on the other hand, and if you listen to my study on Mystery Babylon, Revelation 17 and 18, Mystery Babylon, which is Roman Catholicism, will be destroyed in the not-too-distant future because she is satanic. She is a satanic system. Yeah, I know that there have been Catholics that have prospered. I'm sure that there are some watching this video that have prospered and done well in their life, but that's going to come to an end. God hates the Queen of Heaven, and you cannot worship her. You cannot mess around in that system and expect God to leave you alone. It's not going to happen. Now, what about this thing of Mary, the Queen of the May? I'm going to play a video here, a little music video, if you will, and it's sung by nuns. An order of nuns are singing this thing, and Mary is the Queen of the May. Now, if you know the occult, this witchcraft Babylonian queen is, they celebrate her and they have fertility uh, celebrations and things like that in May, specifically on a day called Beltane, May the 1st. And what you're going to notice in this video when I play it, take notice to the young girls that are putting flowers, crowning Mary with flowers putting it on her head. Take notice of that and take notice to what these little girls are wearing. See, the ancient pagan Babylonian system was that the young girls, the virgins, would be presented in white gowns. That's why even today with marriage ceremonies, you have women wearing white gowns. It goes back to paganism. It doesn't go back to the Bible. You don't see any women in the Bible wearing white gowns when they get married. Um, now, is it a very horrible, evil thing? Well, you know, you can make arguments back and forth, whatever. 
That's not the point. The point is the ceremony of crowning Mary with flowers on her head for the month of May is ancient witchcraft is what this thing is. So let's listen to this. So there you have it. Did you see them wearing the white dresses? Like little bridal gowns and things like that. Some of them even had veils on. Now, you know, they're not taking these young girls, at least maybe not some of them. They're not taking them and they're not sacrificing them and, and allowing them to be molested and raped and things like that. I understand that. But you see, it's the system of the ancient system of the Babylonian witchcraft that has been brought out now and they just make it Christian. But I want to show you something interesting here from this website. It says, May is Mary's month. This is RestoredTraditions.com. It says here, the month of May is dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. People have used a variety of tra traditions, prayers, cost customs, and hymns to manifest this special devotion for the last few centuries. A few examples are singing Marian hymns after the family rosary, making sure there are always fresh cut flowers at her statues, pilgrimages pilgrimages to local Marian shrines, extra rosaries, and more. If you hurry, you can catch the tail end of a rosary crusade for the Catholic Church here. Why is May devoted to Our Lady? Check this out. The Marian devotion, or the, excuse me, the May devotion is in its present form originated at Rome where Father Latomia of the Roman College of the Society of Jesus, there's the Jesuits again, to counteract infidelity and immorality among the students made a vow at the end of the 18th century to devote the month of May to Mary. From Rome, the practice spread to the other Jesuit colleges and thence to nearly every Catholic church of the Latin Rite. There's those Jesuits again. Those Jesuits sure show up a lot, don't they? Here you have the Jesuit uh, Robert Murray writing to Tolkien and saying, 
are you depicting the Virgin Mary with your witch queen, Lady Galadriel? And he says, oh yeah, absolutely. And that witch queen is worshipped as Astarte or Diana or Artemis. Or, there's all these names for, you know, all these different names. But she is worshipped in May. Hmm, interesting. And if you know the Beltane ceremony there, the May pole is a phallic symbol and I'll show you a picture of it here with the little girls in white dresses and the boys in black. See the white dresses again and what they do is they walk opposite directions and they as they're walking they're intertwining these ribbons around the pole symbolizing male and female coming together intercourse. That's what the ceremony is. See all this ancient Bab pagan Babylonian witchcraft it is the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic system. That's what's going on there. It is not Christian. It is not something that God can bless. If you are saved or if you believe to be saved, you need to get out of that system. And if you are saved, the Lord will get you out of that system one way or the other. He will, you will not feel comfortable being there. But you say, what's the deal with this whole Mary thing? You know, you've been saying a lot of crazy accusations and things like this. Oh, let me show you one other thing here quick. I forgot. the um, This book here, we have uh, Lucifer Dethroned, True Story by William and Sharon Schneblin. Um, back here in the back, he gets into some of the satanic holidays, the satanic calendar. There you see Beltane or Valpargus Nacht, uh, May the 1st. Satanic coven requires a human sacrifice, female 1 to 25 years old. Okay, that's if you're a high-level Satanist. So... And of course, you know, uh, Valpurgis Noct and or Beltane, whatever you want to call it, um, is not always going to be human sacrifice. You might have witches that do just, you know, fornication or whatever. Um, but it is a very wicked time. And if you've seen my video on uh, the uh, Masonic symbols and things around Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, um, I showed it in there that the uh, Ephrata Cloister, which was an ancient uh, Rosicrucian colony, the first one in America. Um, they actually erected a um, huge obelisk on May the 1st, on Beltane, there in commemoration of the soldiers that died during the Revolutionary War. So, it's, again, it's all interlaced, it's all tying together. But um, I want to show you just a couple more things here, a few more pictures, and then we're done. Uh, here you have uh, Isis with Horus, you know, this Egyptian statue. And over here you have Semiramis and Tammuz. Hmm. Interesting. You say, what's this have to do with Mary? What's it got to do with Mary? Oh, uh, well, how about all the paintings of Mary in the exact same pose? Here you have this one, that one, another one. There you go. Another one and another one. And there's lots and lots and lots more I could show. We could just keep going on with this study and just keep showing the connections. But what's the point? If you're not convinced by now that Roman Catholicism is satanic, then there's really not much help for you. Um, I'm making these videos to try and, and get through to some of you Catholics out there before it's too late. Uh, some of the atheists as well. I'm trying to get to you because this system of Roman Catholicism is just about ready to take over again. And uh, they're getting more and more power. They've always been in power. But uh, they kind of, you know, it's part weak, part strong. It is the fifth kingdom. And I believe the fifth kingdom is not coming. I believe it's been in here since, ever since the fall of the two legs of iron. Back there in the book of Daniel it talks about these five kingdoms. And I believe that the fifth kingdom has been Roman Catholicism. And it's going to be Roman Catholicism up until the time that the Lord destroys it. They have been a world power since the fall of Rome back in the, I believe it was the 4th century. So, this, this thing is just, I mean, I, I just, I'm getting so frustrated with people because they just don't see it. You know, they're just like, well, I just don't see it. I just don't, I don't agree. I don't, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's just like, if you people knew what my heart was, my heart is for the Catholic people to get them saved, to get them out of that system. Um, I was deceived by Catholicism. I went to a quote-unquote independent fundamental Bible church growing up, but they did a lot of things that were Catholic, you know. 
And now a lot of them there take a light stand on the Catholic system. They use the Vatican versions. So Catholicism has deceived everybody at some level. And we all need to come out of that system. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you better get saved. Mary can't save you. Okay, Mary will never save you. But I want to show you one other book here that really, if you really want to see the Babylonian connections to Roman Catholicism, if you really, really want a good work that will show you all the proof that you need that Roman Catholicism is the ancient pagan witchcraft system of Babylon, right here, put out by Chick Publications, Babylon Religion, How a Babylonian Goddess Became the Virgin Mary, David W. Daniels, illustration by Jack Chick. This is a very, very, very good book, very easy to read, a lot of neat illustrations and things like that, showing how the whole system ties together. Uh, very well documented, believe it or not. I know that there's little comics and stuff in here, but the fact is it's very, very well documented. I mean, you can see footnotes on the pages there. I mean, this thing is a great, great book. Uh, we used to hand this thing out to people and stuff. I mean, it's just, it's a really exceptional book. Uh, I do highly recommend this book. Um, you know, people get upset with uh, Jack Chick and things in Chick publications because they do things that are controversial. Well, so what? <laughs> you know, that's a mark of freedom. You know, you don't say uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center or some of these other wicked satanic organizations, you know, it's a hate group. It's a hate group. Uh, when you start doing that, you're, you're, going back under the dark age Roman Catholic thing of burning people at the stake and declaring heretics and all this other stuff. That's not freedom, that's slavery. So, whatever. You don't want to listen to it, you don't want to read it, you don't want to check these things out that I've said in this study, well then I can't help you. If you're a Catholic and you've watched this whole thing and you're still not convinced, you're as good as being in hell with the door shut. Um, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you get out of that system. If you are convinced now that there are some problems with the Mary of Catholicism, that she's not really the Mary of the Bible, and you feel like you want to get out of it, uh, come to Jesus Christ as a sinner uh, in a broken state. Admit to Him the reality of your condition and put your faith in Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross, the blood that He shed. Uh, not that you drink, but the blood that He shed to pay for your sins. Uh, that's salvation. And it's a salvation that uh, the Roman Catholics can't take away from you. So that is going to be it for this study. I have a few more studies I'm going to come out with here, uh, exposing some of the errors and the lies of Catholicism. Uh, it's just such a huge system of deceit. So many things tie together. I mean, like I said earlier on in my research, uh, it started almost 14 years ago now when I got saved. Uh, it's the Lord just gave me the opportunity that I was able to study um, just relentlessly, you know, day in, day out. And a lot of that stuff, I'd, I'd read things and I'd, I'd find pieces of information and it was just like, what do I do with this? It doesn't really make sense. And as I study more, all of a sudden I realize these things are starting to click together. The whole system becomes clear after a while. And... Um, and also, I just want to say, too, you know, about these, these Lord of the Rings books, these things are satanic. Uh, don't let anybody tell you that this is somehow a Christian analogy of, you know, that Gandalf the wizard is, is in type Jesus Christ. Okay, that's blasphemy. The Bible says back in the Old Testament that you're not to seek after wizards to be defiled by them. You're not going to be defiled by Jesus Christ. So if that's what Tolkien was trying to accomplished, then he's trying to say that you're defiled by Jesus Christ, having that personal relationship with him. So the, the guy is warped. He's a Satanist. All right. And again, I'm going to probably come out with something in, on that in the future, more detail into the whole Lord of the Rings thing, uh, what it's all about. Um, again, it's witchcraft is what it is. The runic language and uh, the whole thing of the two trees, Yggdrasil, you know, and all this other stuff um, that's in part of the Norse paganism witchcraft system and you know you actually have people think Gandalf the wizard is the one who sacrifices himself you know and and he's in type like Jesus actually no when you study Norse paganism um, Gandalf is in type 
you know, like uh, Odin. Woden, you know, he sacrificed himself. So that's what's going on there. Tolkien was not presenting a, you know, artistic Bible story. No, no, he was presenting witchcraft, the ancient, ancient Norse system of witchcraft and bringing it into today and deceiving the masses into thinking that it's Christian so that they're okay with witches and stuff like that. So, and his desire too was to see the reestablishment of the Roman Empire, the Roman Catholic system controlling the world. That's what his whole thing is about. And of course, if you know Bible prophecy, the return of the king is about the return of the Antichrist to restore the Holy Roman Empire. That's what his desire was. That's what this book is about. That's what Tolkien was writing for. And the Bible says in Daniel, the book of Daniel, it talks about the Antichrist will cause craft to prosper in his hand. It's going to prosper in his hand there. So witchcraft is going to be the religion of the Antichrist. I'll quit ranting now because I know a lot of people are probably just like, huh, <laughs> right now. So, um, yeah, I've done a lot of weird studies over the years and things. So it's hard to bring out all this stuff and put it all together. And It took me just about a week to get this thing together. Um, this thing of the Blonde Mary, I've been wanting to do this for years now. It just, the project just kept getting put off and put off and put off and just put on the back burner. And the Lord's given me more information as the years have gone by to put all this stuff together. But uh, it has been a tough study to put together. Definitely can feel the spiritual warfare going on. And of course, as I'm recording this, I'm not even done with the study. I got to edit everything and stuff. So <sighs> please keep the ministry in your prayers. Um, just uh, thank you to everybody that does pray. Thank you to all that donate. Um, that keeps us going. And so I guess that's going to be it for this video. Um, not sure what I'm going to be talking about here in the future here, what the next couple studies are going to be. But uh, I guess you'll find out when they come out. <laughs> so that will be it. Thank you very much for watching. And if you are a Catholic, I really am praying, or if you know Catholics, I pray that you do your very best to witness to them. Get them out of that system. There is so little time left. I mean, it's just getting so bad, so obvious now that the Catholics are Satanists, that it is this Luciferian system. They pray to Lucifer. Unreal. So when they take over, it's going to be bad for the world. Very bad. So that will be it. Thank you very much for watching.